my pleasure to welcome everyone, students, faculty, staff, guests from the community to Concordia College this evening. Seven years ago, the college engaged in a partnership with the National Book Foundation that has resulted in the annual National Book Awards at Concordia. This is an author in residence program that brings two authors from among the current year's National Book Award finalists and winners, brings them to campus to engage with faculty and staff, talking about their books, their writing, their lives. The residency includes master classes and formal presentations in addition to this evening's interview. Concordia's partnership with the National Book Foundation is unique. We are honored to say that we are the foundation's only collegiate partner. This is my first year at Concordia College and therefore my first time at this event. I was delighted today to meet Dr. Harold Augenbrom, the Executive Director of the National Book Foundation who makes the National Book Awards happen and who annually helps to bring Concordia to Concordia College, some of the best writers in America. Harold, would you please stand so that we can recognize you and thank you. We are very pleased to have with us this evening Lynn Neary, who will host the conversation with uh, our visiting authors. Lynn Neary, as many of you know, is an NPR arts correspondent and a frequent guest host for Morning Edition, Weekend Edition, and Talk of the Nation. In her current role on the NPR Arts Desk, Neary covers books and publishing and reports on an industry in transition as publishing moves into the digital age. A Fordham University graduate with a Bachelor's of Arts in English, Neary thinks she has the ideal job and suspects that she is the envy of English majors everywhere. <laughs> in case you haven't noticed, we have taken over the world. <laughs> so it is my pleasure to invite our guests to the stage and turn the microphone over to Lynn. Please welcome them. It is so exciting to be here. I'm uh, thrilled to be in both Minnesota and cross that bridge over into Fargo, North Dakota, which, as I've been telling everybody, always seems like a mythical place to me. So <laughs> now I feel like I've really been to Fargo, and it's very exciting. Um, so I've covered the National Book Awards for NPR for a number of years now. And when you cover something more than once, you're always looking for a new way into the story, a new, a new angle, a new way to tell that story the next morning on the air on Morning Edition. And uh, this year, I left the event with Nikki Finney's acceptance speech ringing in my ears. <laughs> it was so much more than your usual acceptance speech. It was powerful, it was emotional, it was eloquent, it was a poem. And I knew that my story would be poetry stole the show this year at the National Book Awards. So tonight I'm really honored to be here to continue this celebration of poetry. These two women are extraordinary writers whose poems evoke the pain of the past, be it slavery or war. They expose people at their best and their worst. Their poems are deeply personal and politically astute, funny, heartbreaking, tender, and tough. Tang Ha Lai's book for young people, Inside Out and Back Again, is about a young girl named Ha, whose family is forced to leave South Vietnam at the end of the war and ends up in Alabama. The book is a series of poems that link together to create the story of Ha and her family during their last days in their homeland and their first days in a strange new land that is often hostile, unwelcoming, and utterly incomprehensible to this young girl. The story is, of course, based on Tang Ha's life and in Ha, she looked back on her own self and created a funny, feisty, and really unforgettable character. In the introduction to her collection, Head Off and Split, Nikki Finney writes this about a woman, herself, we assume, 
uh, who wants to take her fish home whole. This is what she says. Not a girl any longer, she is capable of her own knife work now. She understands sharpness and duty. She knows what a blade can reveal and destroy. She has come to use life's point and edges to uncover life's treasures. Nikki Finney's poetry does indeed cut through life like a knife, and it is a revelation. From Rosa Parks to Condoleezza Rice, from her mother's <coughs> mink coat to her lover's cattails, she shapes what matters to her into words that are both powerful and poignant. It is great to be with you both Thank here you tonight. So much. And in addition tonight to celebrating poetry, I'd like to honor um, a great poet who died yesterday, Adrienne Rich. And I know that she had a lot of influence on you, Nikki, so I'd like to begin right there. If you could talk about her and how she influenced your work and your life, and I should say, by the way, Nikki has laryngitis. <laughs> I forgot to mention that, so she's going to be struggling through this, so bear with her. on the spot. Now. Okay. <laughs> because we were talking this afternoon and she said, I'm not a poet. And if you read her book, she is a poet. 
whether she wants to admit that or not. But you, you feel that you're not. Well, you know, I, I, um, I came to write these poems by mistake. It's simply because I tried for so long to write prose and it just didn't work. Um, so I have no idea if I'm a poet. I just know that for this particular character, she's 10. We are inside her head. She's thinking in Vietnamese. And in order to, and, and it's in present tense, so it's, it's present day, 10 year old in 1975. In order to understand her feelings and in order to understand the way she processes her emotions and the kind of images that are coming up in her mind as she's standing in the playground and watching all these kids talk about her, and for one, she's not understanding what they're saying about her, but their body language is enough to let her understand. And two, she can't say anything back to them because she doesn't know English. So what is going through her mind? And I tried telling that in sentences, and it just rang false, because she wouldn't be thinking in sentences. She would be thinking in Vietnamese, and in Vietnamese, you think in quick, sharp images, okay? Because Vietnamese is derived from Chinese, and Chinese, of course, written in um, images, according to me. Of course, this is my version of Vietnamese, and I only have one person who really speaks it with me is my mom. So, you know, if you meet another Vietnamese, it would be an entirely different thing, but this isn't what I had come to understand is with me. So I was trying to show this is how she would be thinking as she's standing there. And um, so then I just started jotting down these images and I thought I invented the whole thing. I was like, ooh, you know, this is it. And then I started sending a manuscript out and then the agents would send back emails saying, what you have here is a prose poem novel. I was like, oh, so there's already a name for this and it's been around forever. <laughs> just so you know, I didn't invent anything. So. But what's so interesting about it is that as, as, your, as your character was thinking in Vietnamese, you were yourself as a writer thinking in Vietnamese. I was thinking in Vietnamese, but writing it down in English. So the, the two <coughs> languages just merge. And if you're inside my head, I have this hybrid brain. They just kind of play around. You know, you've heard speakers, um, you've, you've heard people who know two languages, like they'll mix Spanish and English just effortlessly. It'll just flow together. And that's how my brain works. If you're at a family <coughs> reunion of mine, Vietnamese and English would just kind of flow in and out. And we're not even editing it. That's just how it comes out of our brain. So this is very much a result of that. But I couldn't put it, I didn't put that much Vietnamese in because you have to understand it. I just put in just enough for you to get the essence. But as you're reading in English, you're really reading in Vietnamese. And so that's why it's in prose poems. And before I let you hear this, I have, an, I have to turn another question to you now about this, now that you've opened up this topic of modesty and lying. Yeah. Because there's also ambition, which I think women are very afraid of. Sure. And one of the things you said in that remarkable acceptance speech, uh, you told a little story about a teacher. And in that story, you said, um, you mentioned in passing that the only thing you ever wanted to be, the only life you ever wanted to live, was the life of a poet. And I thought, that is remarkable. Who has an ambition to be a poet in this day and age? <laughs> it's not, you know, even people don't read poetry. A lot of people don't even read poetry. How does a young girl come up with that kind of ambition? I want to be a poet and accomplish it. I was a very strange child. <laughs> <laughs>
they just don't speak it loudly because they don't have enough people around them to say, you can do that. Mm -hmm. It's there. I meet them all the time. And they whisper, just like I'm whispering right now, <laughs> I want to be a poet. And I say, okay, you got to make a plan. You have to have a plan in this life. That's the only way it happens. And how did you develop the ambition to become a writer in a language which when you came here at the age of 10 utterly baffled you and, and really made your life very unhappy for well, a while? Well, I think it, what, it just happened naturally. First, they took away my language. They took away Vietnamese. And if I'm going to live here, and it seemed like by you know, the end of 75 that we were here to stay, I had to reclaim a new language in order to express myself. I had to be able to yell back at those kids on the playground. I mean, that was my goal. I wasn't trying to be a writer. I was just trying to get the kids on the playground. And, um, and so naturally, you know, and, and English is it's just a tough language to learn. I was 10, and within six months, I was speaking grammatically incorrect English, but I was able to be understood. But to truly learn it to the level where you feel like this is yours and, and you've mastered it, it just took decades. It just took forever. And because it was such a hard endeavor and it wasn't given to me at birth, of course I pursued it. <laughs> and, um, and at first I thought, you know, I can't write literature. That's probably not in my realm. I'm going to try journalism. So I majored in journalism, but it was so unbelievably boring um, to me. I thought, I, Thank you, you know, very much. <laughs> I, I wasn't at Lynn's level. I'm sure if I had her job, I would just sail. I was a cop reporter on the um, weekends beat, and my stories would be like, there's another body underneath the tree. Go cover that. And there's another fatality on Highway 405. Go, go cover that. Or it's windy today. Think of a new angle to talk about the wind. <laughs> or, you know, we felt sort of maybe a slight earthquake out of the riverside. Cover that. <laughs> Those were my stories. And I thought, really? This can't be. And so I would go home. And uh, I've been reading all my life. And I think if you're going to read, at some point you're going to write. You can't help it. This is what happens. And I've been reading and reading. And, you know... At night, when you go home and you're frustrated with your police beat, what are you going to do? You're going to just write something. And it turned out to be fiction, and I, I've been, I just started doing it, and it felt really good. And I think your mind just naturally goes toward what feels good. And at that point, journalism didn't feel good because I wasn't at NPR. You know, just writing random sentences at midnight felt really good. And I come from a literary tradition because my mother has been quoting poetry to me all my life. So the two just kind of come together. But I probably wouldn't be a writer if I were in Vietnam, to tell you honestly, because the language wasn't taken from me. There's no reason, there's no fighting involved. You just kind of grow up and you speak Vietnamese, and there it is. If I wasn't, you know, in Vietnam, I wouldn't be the odd person out in Alabama. So there's nothing building up inside of you that you need to scream out at. You just kind of go, okay, life was really easy in Vietnam. So as odd as it sounds. And so. There's a couple of poems we've <laughs> talked about um, where you, you talk about how it felt to lose the language. I wonder if you could read, read those. And how did you feel in class to... <coughs> Let's see. There is a poem where... Um, you know, when I came here, I was a, um, what I thought was a pretty smart kid in Vietnam. You know, I had figured out the system. I have eight older brothers and sisters, and if you just watch them grow up as the youngest kid, what you do is you just you soak up what they already know. So then whatever it is that they know, by the time you're in first grade, you already know it because you felt like they through this. And so I felt pretty savvy in Vietnam. I figured it out. And um, this is me in Alabama. Okay? Feel dumb. Miss Scott points to me, then to the letters of the English alphabet. I say A, B, C, and so on. She tells the class to clap. I frown. Miss Scott points to the numbers along the wall. I count up to 20. The class claps on its own. I'm furious, unable to explain. I already learned fractions and how to purify river water. So this is what dumb feels like. I hate, hate, hate it. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one right after that, I think. Yes, it's called Wishes. Um, she's in Alabama at this point, and she's wishing. I wish Brother Coy wouldn't keep inside how he endures the hours in school that mother wouldn't hide her bleeding fingers, that Brother Guang wouldn't be so angry after work. I wish our cowboy could be persuaded to buy a horse, 
that I could be invisible until I can talk back, that English could be learned without so many rules. I wish Father would appear in my class speaking beautiful English as he does French and Chinese and hold out his hand for mine. Mostly, I wish I were still smart. In that last poem, um, a lot of the threads of the story are there. Um, part of it that your uh, father uh, was missing in action in Vietnam and that when you left, you left him behind. And this was a really difficult decision for the whole family to make, but certainly for your mother. And your, tell me about your mother. You know, even today, um, I would sit down and I would ask her, how on earth did you make that decision? And she said, it's actually quite easy. You're, you're inside history. And when you're inside history, things happen to you. Okay. She wasn't the only one trying to contemplate whether to leave Saigon during the last days of war. Everyone was planning a way out. Okay. So when you have thousands of people planning the same thing, it's very much like applying to college here. You're not the only one applying to college. Everybody is applying to college. It's just what people are doing. So she did it, and she said there were two things she could count on. One, American guilt that it's right after the war, there are thousands of people rolling around at sea, somebody is going to do something. You know, they just wouldn't leave them there. So it was perfectly fine to leave. And two, she raised smart children. And she's been doing this um, because she, you know, my mom first left North Vietnam because of communism to come to South Vietnam. So it wasn't really that big of a step to leave South Vietnam to go across the world because she's done it. And she raised her children to pretty much survive everywhere. Or anywhere. But it, so. it seems like she, yeah. even she didn't really realize what you were getting into. Nobody when knew. You got I mean, how can them. you predict Alabama? <laughs> <laughs> and you can say that in Minnesota, you know. <laughs> so you had a pretty formidable mother. You have a pretty formidable and amazing mother yourself, I think. I have a very formidable mother. Very. You're a fearless woman, and I have this sense that maybe the only person who really scares you is your own mother. <laughs> And my grandmother, <laughs> which is her mother. <laughs> and you have a number of amazingly strong women in your poems. So how did those two women, your mother and your grandmother, how did they influence your poetry? How do, how do, how do we get to know them through your poetry? My grandmother, I was talking about this today, was a farming woman in South Carolina. And she was about four foot eleven. And she would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go to sleep at 8 o'clock at night. And I spent my summers growing up with her. And so she taught me, and this is very, very important, she taught me how to work. That sounds simple, but it's not. There are a lot of people who don't understand the work ethic. And my grandmother taught me working was essential to one's life. The second thing she taught me, as I said today, was about telling the truth. She's very, very keen on washing my mouth out with soap <laughs> if I didn't tell the truth. So I came to understand the power of telling the truth at a very early age. The other thing she would do, if my grandfather did not agree with something she would want to do, she would strike off on her own and do it herself. So this was like my first blush at fem feminism. She wasn't, she was a dutiful wife and all that stuff, but you make her mad. <laughs> she would just do it in her own way and I watched her do that. So she taught me a lot about my girl power. The other thing, my mother, her daughter, my mother is my grandmother's only daughter. I am my mother's only daughter. My mother has two brothers and I have two brothers. And so this was a lot passed down because of that matrilineal line. But my mother nor my grandmother were writers. They, they did other things, but they taught me my love of books. So they encouraged the reading, just like we were talking today. I'm a voracious reader and just like Donna says if you read long enough you start wondering can I do this and then you start trying it I'll never forget my first poems came about as a result of my mother 
giving me one of those little diaries with the key. You know what I'm talking about. And so to this day, I have a shelf of journal books, all numbered on the outside, right here on the spine, one through 177. From the time I was 10 years old till now. And so I can follow the map of my life. I can follow what I was reading. I can follow when the library was segregated and we couldn't go in. And what my mother said to me when we finally did go into that library, I said, Mom, there are no books here by black people. And she said, I guess you're going to have to write those yourself. Mm -hmm. Great permission from these two women in my life. Can you read? I don't know how, if you can read with your voice, or can you try? <laughs> I'd love to hear a poem that sort of reflects either a poem about them or that reflects that strong. I'd like to. I'd like to just read a section <clears throat> about Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was um, a larger-than-life figure in my life growing up. And the poem, Red Velvet, begins this book. I'm just going to read a section of it. She was not a child. She was in her 40s, a seamstress, a woman devoted to handmade things. A seamstress brings fabric and thread, collars and hems, buttonholes together. She is one who knows her way around velvet. Arching herself over a river of cloth, she feels for the bias, but doesn't cut, not until the straight pins are in place, marking everything in time, everything will come together. By 42, your heart is heavy with slavery, lynching, and the lessons of being good. You have heard 7,844 Sunday sermons on how God made every woman in his image. You do a lot of thinking with a thimble on your thumb. You have hemmed 8,230 skirts for nice, well-meaning white women in Montgomery. You have let the hem out of 18,809 pant legs for growing white boys. You have pricked your finger 45,203 times. You have held your peace. I'll stop there. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to write something about Rosa Parks that went beyond the fact that she didn't get up off the bus. And in America, we like sound bites. We don't like to look at the whole history. We like 18 words or less. Rosa Parks didn't get up off the bus and we say it every Black History Month. But we don't know Rosa Parks was a master seamstress who sewed in Montgomery, Alabama for years and years and years. And I want, as a poet, to bring in things we don't know about people so that we get a more complete picture. That brings me to a question that I wanted to ask both of you, which is, <coughs> You write about the immigrant experience. You certainly write a great deal about the experience of African Americans in this country going back to slavery. Do you both, with your writing, feel like you are giving voice to people who do not have a voice? Do you think in those terms at all? I don't, simply because I am not sure if I can represent an entire group of people. Uh, when I was a journalist, we would have uh, I was a journalist out in Orange County, um, California, and there are more Vietnamese living there than anywhere else in the world except for Vietnam itself. So, um, you know, stories about Vietnamese would come up constantly, and then I as a journalist, they, my editor would say, well, run out and get the Vietnamese reaction. And I was like, well, who am I supposed to interview? Just random <laughs> Vietnamese out in the street? So then I tried that, and they weren't happy with it. So then I had to call up some big restaurant person. Well, why is this restaurant person, the representative of, of this group. So I've never felt comfortable with representing a group. I will say that individually I've gotten <coughs> emails from individual Vietnamese Americans who, who felt something 
when they read this book, whether it's their parents' stories or whether it's something they didn't know. And that, to me, rings true. You know, that is an individual reaction to a story. And that I can trust. Um, but to have me represent a group, I can guarantee you right now, if you went to Orange County and interview just random strangers, they would say, well, that's not right. That's not what happened to me. You know, that's not true. That's not how I felt. And that would be perfectly fine because that would be their stories. Oh. What about you? I, I think I agree with, I agree with that. I think that um, it's very important to honor what you're writing about and not try to represent everybody or a group. Every group has different people in that group. And until we start understanding that, we're going to keep writing stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And so I try to pick something, a path that I'm following, that I want to honor about, as you say, one person, or an individual, or myself, or a thought, and honor that, and make that the path that I follow. But you can't possibly write one thing around one black person and think that represents all black people. It's impossible. And it does a disservice. But you know, um, reading the obituary today of Adrienne Rich in the New York Times, it talked about the fact that she's a poet who was also very political, <coughs> and that she saw poetry and politics as something very seamless. Absolutely. And I think your poetry is quite political also. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the intersection of poetry and politics? How does poetry... You know what I don't understand? When I was, my first book of poetry, I was 26. I'll never forget. A man stood at the back of the room after, and he raised his hand and he said, young lady, I'm going to give you some information that I want you to follow for the rest of your life. <laughs> Stop writing that political poetry. It'll get you nowhere. Your poet is very explicitly, your poetry can be, very, at time, not all of it, can be very explicitly political. And I would say, agree with you, that yours probably... I, I would say it's political, it but I, um, I purposely made it not in your face um, political, but the politics happen to this girl. It comes out through the story and through the character. And that's pr very much how I was introduced to politics. You know, um, no one in Vietnam chose the, the political situation they were in, except for the few men who said, okay, there's going to be a war and we're going to fight it like this and that. Most of us were just reacting to their decisions. And I've watched my mother, who started out life as this rich girl in North Vietnam, and I've watched her life just turn inside out because these certain men, and you can name them, there are only five or six of them, um, <laughs> um, they're, they're gone now. Um, 
And uh, they made their decisions, and it was very brave and rah, rah, rah. But I don't think they sat down and thought, okay, once we make these decisions to do this and to do this with this thing called war and with this thing called politics and with this thing called idealism, that it would affect certain people in this way. I personally know exactly how it affected my mother. Um, it just twisted her life inside out. And then I didn't get a father because of these decisions made by these five men. So I'm constantly thinking, well, why didn't they just lock these five men up in a room and let them duke it out themselves <laughs> with a few other people they wanted to fight with, and then that will be that. But that's just not how the world works. And so I've watched my mom deal with politics all her life. And she, um, her way is to understand there are certain things you cannot change. You can't stop a war by yourself. But you can certainly react to the war, to that war, and, and the consequences of that war in a way that is meaningful to you in a way that says, I, I'm going to work around it. And her way is to raise children, the kind of children that she would want running the world later. Okay? The, the kind of children that, who would make better decisions than these five men who are affecting um, all these millions of people in this little country, and then it's affecting just about everyone else too. So I think in that sense, I don't think you can be alive today and not be political, even if you don't think of yourself as political, because by not acting, you are doing something. You're letting someone else act, and that is a political act in itself. So I just think I was born into politics, and directly or indirectly, it's just in my blood, is there. Okay. I wonder if you could read that section of where your mother is making the decision to leave, trying to persuade her children, and then the last moments of your life in okay. Vietnam. Um, and, and, and as you read this, this is... Um, will give you a sense of how this, these poems turn into a narrative. I think okay. Um, picked a few that sort of okay. flow as a narrative. I'm going to start with quiet decision. <clears throat> Dinner time, I help mother peel sweet potatoes to stretch the rice. I start to chop off a potato's end as wide as a thumbnail, then decide to slice off only a sliver. I am proud of my ability to save until I see tears in mother's deep eyes. You deserve to grow up where you don't worry about saving half a bite of sweet potato. And then, um, and then, then choice. Into each pack, one pair of pants, one pair of shorts, three pairs of underwear, two shirts, sandals, toothbrush and paste, soap, 10 palms of rice grains, three clumps of cooked rice, one choice. I choose my doll, once lent to a neighbor who left it outside, where mice bit her left cheek and right thumb. I love her more for her scars. I dress her in a red and white dress with matching hat and booties that mother knitted. And then Saigon is gone. I listen to the swish, swish of mother's handheld fan, the whispers among adults, the bombs in the ever greater distance. The commander has ordered everyone below deck, even though he has chosen a safe river route to connect to the sea, avoiding the obvious escape path through Vuong Tau, where the communists are dropping all the bombs they have left. I hope Titi got out. Mother is sick with waves in her stomach, even though the ship barely creeps along. We hear a helicopter circling, circling near our <coughs> ship. People run and scream, communists! Our ship dips low as the crowd runs to the left and then to the right. This is not helping mother. I wish they would stand still and hush. The commander is talking. Do not be frightened. It's a pilot for our side who has jumped into the water letting his helicopter plunge in behind him. The pilot appears below deck, wet and shaking. He salutes the commander and shouts. At noon today, the communists crashed their tanks through the gates of the presidential palace and planted on the roof a flag with one huge star. Then he adds what no one wants to hear. It's over. Saigon is gone. Do you have any sense as a young girl of what was really happening to you at that time? Well, you know, um, this, by the end of April, even by mid-April, two weeks before this happened, everyone was running around saying, we have to get out. You know, everyone was making plans. And the ones with the true connections would be flying out of the country. That was the, the, the deluxe way to go. Well, we didn't have that connection, but my dad was in the Navy. 
So then we were like, you know, we will go out through um, with a ship. And I, even, I don't think my mother thought we would be gone forever. Pretty much we would get out, let the country calm down, and we would turn around and come right back. And even when I was standing in Alabama and facing down these bullies and not being able to speak back to them, I thought, you know, this will be over soon. I will be going back. And it kept dragging on and on and on. <laughs> and then one day you just realize you're not going to go back. You might as well learn English. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we've been talking about it in political terms, but, but your book and your poetry is also, they are also deeply personal. I mean, this really delves into your, what happened to you as a child in a very, very painful uh, way, and to your family. So poetry seems to be able to get at both, both the larger you know, politics and the very personal. I think that's the only way you're going to get readers to read it. You know, if it's so political, I think there are so many political texts out there that people read and they pretty much fall asleep. And if it's personal but without any message at all, then it would just be a cute little memoir. You know, this would happen to me. But somehow you can combine the two, and especially if you just throw in some humor. They'll read it. Interesting, too, that it, your, your, your narrator, of course, is a 10-year-old, mm -hmm. and this is a book for young people. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised when I read it. Uh, I, I just found it a great read. And then I looked at the jacket cover, I think, and it said... Uh, you know, eight and up or something like that. And I thought, wow, I really, <laughs> my reading level has <laughs> gone down. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think this is a great book for, uh, for adults as well. And I wonder if that's frustrating to you at all sometimes. Uh, it's not. Um, the, you know, the young adult world has been so kind to me, but I certainly didn't write it um, for young adults. I'm, I'm clueless when it comes to marketing. I just sit down and I think, okay, I have a 10-year-old girl. I'm going to write it inside her head, and wherever it goes, it goes. And when I finished it, I started sending it out to agents, and they all emailed back saying, what you have here is what's called a middle-grade post-prone novel, and you need to find the correct agent. And I was like, oh. You know, I didn't know they had genres and that they separate people into these age categories, and it's all for marketing. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a good book for any age. But, you know, that whole idea of the, 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 the personal in poetry, because you explore so many things in your poetry, um, including your own sexuality. Uh, you are gay, yes. and you write about that in your poetry. Yes. And there's one poem, I don't know if you want to read it, Oriel? Would you read that poem? Sure, if I can. It, if I can to me, and, well, maybe we can talk about this after you read it. Okay. <clears throat> I stop, I stop my hand midair. If I touch her there, everything about me will be true. The new world discovered without pick or axe. I will be what Brenda Jones was stoned for in 1969. My hand remembers treading the watery room just behind rose veiled eyes of memory. Alone in the yard, tucked beneath the hood of her car, lucky clover all about her feet, green tea sweet necklace for her mud pie, crusty work boots. She fins off their spit and words with silent two-handed twists and turns of her socket wrench, a hurl of sticks and stones, and only me to whisper as a girl for her from the sidewalk far, break my bones. A grown woman in grease pocket overalls inside her own sexy transmission, despite the crowding of hurled red hots beneath the hood of the candy apple Camaro. That's the backstory, and then the poem jumps to present time. The stars over the Atlantic are dangling salt crystals. The room at the Seashell Inn is $20 a night. No one else here but us and the night clerk. My lips are red snails in the primal search for every constellation hiding in the sky of your body. My hand waits for permission for my life to change forever. Won't he soon climb the stairs and bam on the hood of this car? You are a woman with film reels for eyes. Our skin is one endless prayer bead of brown. If my hand ever lands, I will fly past dreaming Australian aborigines. I will never be able to wash or peel any of this away. Before the night is over, someone I do not know 
just as I am jumped and kneed and pulled finally to the high ground of sweet clover. Mm. Can you tell me what that poem is about? I grew up in a very small town in South Carolina. And every day I walked to school, there was a woman working on her, she lived on the street. I went to Catholic school and she would work on her car in the morning. And the kids I walked with, some of them would want to stop and throw rocks at her because she was a very um, masculine looking woman. And of course the name calling happened. And I was silent, but I was also heartbroken because I was afraid to say anything in defense of her. And I always promised myself that as I got older, I would write a poem in honor of her coming outside and being her beautiful self out in the sunlight every morning. And so this poem is a tribute to Brenda Jones and working on her souped up Camaro in the yard every morning. And I've forgiven myself as a girl of nine for not defending her because I didn't quite know how to do that then. But as a poet, I can do it now. I also read it as a moment in which you were saying, <coughs> I'm ready to say this is who I am. This well, is what I am. <coughs> that's, that's what I, I said to you. I'm telling you about Brenda Jones in the first part. And then the poem indents and becomes present time. And it's me remembering that the, the way that this country defines you and puts a label on you, that if I touch this person in the poem, it's over, that everything is gonna come tumbling down. And those rocks that were thrown at Brenda Jones will then be thrown at me. And I have to be willing in, this, in the moment of the poem to say, okay, let them come. Another thing that you write about in your poetry, um, that as much as you <coughs> are close to your family and love your family and have gotten incredible strength from, from your family, um, there's also a sense in your poetry that you, th that dichotomy between love and then fearing that you're gonna disappoint them because of who you are, because oh, of what you do. Yes. You write about that very eloquently as well. Oh, thank you. It's, it's something that never leaves you. I'm extremely close to my family, and I would never want to disappoint them. I know I do. But the other part of that is, that's that side. But this side is, I get one life, and I was raised by my grandmother, who taught me to tell the truth. And so, in order to live both lives, I have to be myself. I have to speak out from this mouth into that air and then say my prayers and hope they don't disown me. And they haven't. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but the other thing that happens when you tell the truth is that you find out what that love is made of. And I needed to find that out for myself in my life, and I did. And that love was bigger than I thought it was. And that's what happens when you tell the truth in any situation, especially one that's very difficult. Well, I didn't see it, but I've heard that at the National Book Awards, your parents were there and very excited. Very apparently. excited. <laughs> okay, I'll tell the story. I won't go into the, I just told this, but we were sitting there and you don't know if you're, you know, you don't know who's gonna win, you really don't. And they'd call out the, nom the, um, the nominees and my mom was sitting one person away from me. And when they called my name, I remember my head went down in my lap in disbelief and my mom jumped up and she put my head in a wrestling federation Headlock. <laughs> I didn't know she knew how to do that. <laughs> and she kept shouting, you won, you won. And my father was beside her with his cane. And he was trying to say, let her go. <laughs> and 
And I said, what a fiasco. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you see the tape, you'll see it takes a very long time for me to get on camera. <laughs> <laughs> so she let me go. <laughs> and you, you also have a mother who at times was, um, you also just grapple with that sense of getting so much from your mother and so much from your family, and yet there were times when perhaps she wasn't sure, exactly sure what you were, where you were uh, heading in life, right? She's, she wants what she wants. Um, <laughs> Any she, mother um, does. <laughs> Any mother does. And uh, when I was on the straight and narrow path, when I got my journalism degree and got a job out in Orange County Register, I was shiny, so that was fine. She could deal with that. And then when I quit, she just couldn't understand why would you leave this job. And I kept trying to explain to her I was going to craft sentences. You know, this is my life's obsession. I was going to sit there and craft sentences. And she's like, why? Why would you do that? And, and, and she has a... Um, she herself is a poet, but she comes from the tradition, you write for yourself and you, you don't get published. And if you do get published, you get published under a pseudonym. Because you just, you don't want that much attention for yourself. And you, you would be never, modest. <laughs> right? This kind of modesty. But I also knew it was false modesty because I have watched this, this, she's made of iron. I have watched this woman raise nine children and I have watched her make one decision after another and she doesn't flinch. Once she makes it, she goes. And she has six boys. They all listen to her. Even now, they just listen to her. I mean, she must have something. And so I thought, you know, at some point, I had to just start lying to her. That was how I got away. Um, she doesn't actually need to know exactly what I'm doing. She just needs to know kind of like the shadow of me. So if she just kind of thinks that I'm in graduate school, she doesn't need to know that I dropped out. So we'll just let her keep thinking that I'm in graduate school. This is not advice for you, by the way. No. <laughs> Don't do this. Um, but you can lie or not <laughs> so, lie. Um, <laughs> and then after a while, you know, I mean, and, and then what you have to do also is just wait her out, okay? The first few years, she's still quite interested in your life. She's like, what are you doing? What are you writing? Ten years, are you going to get married, okay? <laughs> Twenty years, she's like... She doesn't even ask anymore. You know, you're alive, you're kind of walking around, you wash your hair today, good, we're ready to go. Um, so you just wait them out. And then when it finally happened, when, um, you know, this is the first book I've ever gotten published, and, and it won something, she's like, oh, good. Now we can go back to just not tiptoeing around me and, and not saying things that, that she thinks would hurt my feelings because it did take so, so long. And so on, on the one hand, she was pushing me, and then on the other hand, she was just really tender at the same time, knowing that, you know, I'm just trying so hard to accomplish something. So I think any human being is like that. They're going to give you a double side and ask yourself, and you're trying to figure out who you are, you're going to have double sides also. And then you figure out pretty soon which side you show to whom. And once you do that, I think um, you become an adult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'd love you to read a, a section from the book that I think will give you an idea of um, how feisty this character, <laughs> Ha, is, uh, who is based on <clears throat> somebody who's sitting right here. And um, it, it's sort of an extension of what we read, what, what she read before. Um, um, you can explain that. Okay, so I'm, Al, um, so, so I'm in Alabama, and... Um, there's this boy, I called him Pink, um, Pink Boy, who just didn't like me, and who knows why. You know, there's just so many reasons why um, someone doesn't like you. And again, my language is taken away, and then this is the point where I start to reclaim um, a little bit of language, okay? This is called doo-doo, face. Again, they're yelling, Buddha, Buddha, but I know to run toward Brother Koi, two corners away. Enough time for them to repeat hundreds of Buddhas. Enough time for me to churn and yell, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> I love how they stop, mouths open. My heart lifting, I run and shout, bully, coward, pink snot face. Words I learned from them on the playground. Okay. I turn to see pink boy coming close to me. No longer pink, he's red. Blood orange <coughs> red like a ripe papaya. Doo-doo face. It's not my fault if his friends hear doo-doo face, and they are laughing right at him. Brother Koi is waiting. I jump on. And then a shift. Pink boy plows <coughs> toward me. I squat in dung tan, facing him. His right arm extends in a fist. When he's close enough to me to see the white arm hair, I shift my upper body to the left, legs sturdy, 
Eyes on the blur that fly past me. A thud. Pink boy writhes on the pavement. I thought I would love to see him in pain, but he looks more defeated than weak, more helpless than scared, like a caged puppy. He's getting up. If I were to kick him, it must be now. And then a roar. Pink boy and I churn a gigantic motorcycle. The rider in all black stops. The helmet comes off. Vu Li. Wow. Pink boy disappears. Brother Koi runs up, out of breath, pushing a bicycle with a flat. Vuli <laughs> flicks his head. I climb on first, wrap my arms around a waist, tight as rope. Brother Koi climbs on next, one hand holding the handlebar of his bike. We fly home. <laughs> Saved by the brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Saved by the brothers. <laughs> but, you know, that, that, that poem, uh, that part of the, of the book is when, as you said, when you find your voice. What was that like for you when you did... It was Begin just, to get that voice. It was so incredibly satisfying. You know, because in Vietnam, I wasn't that nice a kid. And I'm sure it was payback that I had to suffer like this in Alabama for a little while. Um, but, you know, when I was able to turn back and just yell something at them, I just felt, and they actually understood me. Okay? And I was like, wow, so this is how it works. So then I will learn English, and then I took it very seriously just so I can start talking back. Um, and I think once you reclaim language, um, you reclaim yourself, and then you have to alter, because it is a different language, you're really, really reclaiming a different self, and you just alter it to the, uh, uh, the new space. And, um, and it took a while, but it all worked out. Yeah. <laughs> now, do you think that you will write um, in poetry in your, in your next book, that your next book will be a prose poem also? I don't think so, just because this uh, voice is particular to this character. So unless I am going to be inside the mind of another character who's thinking in <coughs> Vietnamese, there's really no reason for it um, that I can see. And I'm sure one day I'll, I'll return to post poems, but my next one will just be in prose because I'm going to be thinking inside the mind of a 12-year-old American girl. American did did you like girl. writing writing in in, pro, in This was so easy. This is how I think. I mean, this is actually my brain thinking. So, you know, all this came out within six months. Uh -huh. It just went whoosh. <laughs> Uh -huh. I wonder, do you think that poetry gets its due? Oh. No. <laughs> Why not, do you think? I think it's because um, how poetry is taught in this country. I think it's history about um, how we think we don't understand poetry. I think there are a lot of different reasons why that's so. And I think that um, it takes courage to teach it and to talk about it and to give students the opportunity to write it from where they are in the world, not from where you want them to be in the world. I think that's very important. But I think, um, I think more and more is such a strong time for poetry in so many ways, in so many different kinds of poetry. So I feel really good about the future and, you know, we come from a, an amazing, history and it's just gonna I think keep getting stronger do you think that people would be more open to poetry if they heard it more yes often? absolutely go to a reading go th believe think you're not gonna like it and just go and sit and listen be open to a new poet a new way of saying yes I was uh, yes I absolutely and do, do you feel that you have more now to say, do you, do you feel like you still have more to say about the immigrant experience? I think for the rest of my life I will be writing about the immigrant experience because that's just the angle I come from. I will, um, of course, have different characters and, and different settings, but you know, this is my world and you write about your world. And it's really the only world that interests me. I mean, I don't know why I would write about, let's say, a 34-year-old single woman trying to date in New York City because there are already 2,000 books about that. You know, um, they're all over the place. So I just, I, I think this is it. And, um, and this is, you know, as a writer, you sit alone for so long. And you sit and you stare out the window and you sit and you stare out the window. So whomever it is that you're thinking about, that person has to fascinate you to no end or you're going to abandon the character. And for me, the characters that interest me are the ones who are thrown into this foreign world and how do they survive it. And also the backstory, you know. Yeah. Every character that I think about, I, I can 
basically go back 4,000 years and know how they got to their present state. And to me, that's fascinating. If I can't imagine you 4,000 years ago and what your, whoever it was that was related to you was doing and why they, they, they made the decisions they made to get you to where you are today, I think I would abandon the project just because it's, you know, it just wouldn't fascinate me. And none of that will show up in the novel. It's just for me. It's just for me as a writer to sit there and think about it. And one other thing for you, Nikki, going back to what I said at the beginning, quoting from um, that introduction where you yeah. said, um, uh, I can do my own knife work now, yeah. that whole section there. Yeah. Can you just tell me a little bit more, what, what were you thinking, what were you meaning by that? I was a little girl who was sent to the fishmonger to bring dinner home for my family. I would walk in with, and get a silver bowl and I'd fill it with fish and I'd hand it to the fishmonger and he would say, head off and split, which means I'll take away all the ugly stuff that you don't want to see, the gray eyes, the fins, all of that ugly stuff, and I'll just leave the succulent flesh. I had done this my entire life. Seven years ago, I go home and I do that again, and I walk out with my fish, and I went, wait a minute, I smell a poem, you know, and I sat down and I wrote this title down and I thought, this is bigger than just a fish. There's something else going on here. I want to talk about in this book the things we cut away, the things we don't want to see, the things we don't want to talk about, the things people tell you aren't nice to talk about. Go talk about something that's comfortable. I want to get us out of our comfort zones. We have to, as a country, as women, as people, be able to talk one-on-one -on -one about things we don't agree with in order for this country to start telling the truths it needs to tell. And I thought, as my, my job as a poet is to one little slice, one little slice, maybe I can help us get there. Not the whole thing, but just one piece. Can I, can I read something? Absolutely. I'm going to try. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think this might be the last poem I'll read, but I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I have to tell you this story. Do you know the uh, film March of the Penguins? <laughs> so I'm in the movie theater, and it's dark, and I'm finally away from my desk and I decide to just go see a movie. I go see March of the Penguins. So the, the, the male penguin is standing there with the little penguin on his feet, right? And the mother penguin comes back. You remember this scene? And she's been gone for like 13,000 years. <laughs> and she's been eating and eating and eating. You remember? And what does she do? She throws up in the baby penguin's mouth. <laughs> and I say to myself, wait a minute, that happened to me once. My mother comes into the theater. Her presence comes into the theater. So I want to read you what I thought about. I ran home, I got my pencil. Because the great poet, Denise Levertoff, who's no longer with us, she said, you smell a poem before you see it. And I smelled a poem and I wanted to catch it. <clears throat> Penguin, mullet, 
to say, Mama, pull the flesh from the throat, not the belly. The meat there has more juice than the meat from the fins, but she is the Mama. She chews down on the flesh of the fish, packs it around good until it is a perfect caramel mush. Catching some of the juice that falls with her longest finger, she pushes all of the sweet flesh back inside. Once or twice, she pulls out a hat pin sized bone hiding in the waves of tender meat. Only then does she wear her eureka smile. This, she says, is why you have a mama. This, she says, is why you must never talk back to me. <laughs> why you must love, honor, and obey me. My job, her toes, pas de deux, is to feed and tell you the stories and keep you away from sharp things that might slip into your throat and never completely disappear. She reaches her long brown fingers deep inside her jaw. Our hinged mouths open mine prematurely. My fists are flying fleshy verbs in the apple air of her kitchen, bald in sweet anticipation. The pounded succulent fish and spit lands on the center of my tongue. I swell in my first chair ever, fed by the mother who relishes the story of turning her back and leaving me once to swim off a thousand miles, find food, fight off shimmering shark, then swim a thousand miles back just to drop her beak into mine. I am the lucky girl of the high chair. <laughs> Thank you. Nikki Finney, <laughs> Ken Harlai. Go home and smell a poem. Thank you. Like me sitting here this evening, you may have asked yourself more than once how you got to be so lucky uh, as to sit here this evening. Of course, part of that is because of the wonderful gifts of the poets and the journalists who are here with us this evening. Uh, Nikki talked about learning to work hard. An event like this happens because someone works hard. And two of the people who have worked hard to make this happen this year <coughs> and other years are Scott Olson of our English faculty and Tracy Moorhead of the President's Office. These people are here because of their good, hard work. Would you please join me in thanking them? <laughs> And now I get to invite everyone to go out into the atrium for some refreshments and book signing. And before we go, please join me in thanking our guests for their wonderful work.